So here I'm going to go deep dive into sort of payout and think about what expectations there are and what protections exist. And then we're going to talk a little bit about voting rights, sort of what is their value, what limitations are there on shareholders for bringing up proposals. And this might get into some topics about like minority shareholders and you know how we think of them having a voice. Okay. So if there's no further questions, I'm gonna um, get started on my background on corporate boards. So according to the OECD, the principles of corporate governance tell us that the responsibility is the board. And they, they list it out and they're saying, the corporate governance framework should ensure the strategic guidance of the company, the effective monitoring of the management and the board's accountability to the company and shareholders. What I see that as is that basically you have this dual mandate. This is what people actually often call it. You're both an advisor and a monitor. Okay. So it's two roles. It's not just one. So the board consults with management generally regarding the strategy and direction of the company. Okay. And remind yourselves that boards at regardless of what stage it is, um, can be, uh, need the strategic advice. So if you think when you bring the VC on, the reason you're bringing the VC on early on is because, you know, they are getting pitched by every other company out there right now. They have a very good sense of the industry and the layout and maybe where you might need to pivot. They know where business opportunities are. I always love to teach in my class. I don't know if you know about Instagram. It was actually originally called bourbon. Um, it was supposed to be like a four square to check in when you're drinking whiskey except for they had a really good VC who was like, look, most people are looking at your pictures. They're not looking at your other stuff. Why don't you like pivot to be more general that way? You know, this stuff is useful. Um, and then also about oversight. You know, it is really helpful to rein in somebody when they're not exactly making the best decisions and sort of keeping people in check. So this is um, a timeline, mind you, not all boards are the same, but this is sort of, if you were gonna go with the best practices, this would be a best practices in terms of the board timeline. So thinking again, the shaping, this is more the advisory role, and then this is sort of, they called it the fiduciary, but this is what I really think of as your responsibilities to your investors. And so basically at every meeting, you're gonna get information. And this is, you know, in Dow world, this could be the community check-ins, but you could think of this as a more select group of people. You're getting information, the beginning of the year, you're also, because most people end their fiscal year in December, you're going to have a lot of the account reviews and thinking about your audits. And then you're going to go through in the spring and sort of try and understand, okay, where are we on a risk situation? How did we actually perform? What do we need to change about sort of legal and regulatory? Okay, and then you do that at the half year. Strategy is actually what most people say is the biggest value add of boards. And that's because they're going to spend a ton of time on strategy uh, throughout the year. Um, also part of strategy, obviously, is thinking about the competitive landscape. Who's out there? Who, do you have a competitive moat? Sort of things, types of things. Every time they review investment proposals, um, this is actually, what, in, ironically, where they say they add the least value. Um, this happens to be, I've seen, a, you're starting to see consolidation because people are, you know, maybe getting close to insolvent uh, in the crypto space, but typically this is M&A review, um, which is time consuming. Talent and quality review, this is like thinking about, uh, you know, managers pay for levels below you and risk management. Okay, and then they do a lot of teamwork building. I think that's a critical thing. Um, remind yourselves, and we're going to talk about this in a second, you're bringing on a lot of independent, cognitively diverse people who might not necessarily and usually are all, you know, founders in their own rights or have done something and may not all get along. And so it's sort of important to build both that trust because you want a, you know, robust conversation, as I like to say, you want to have that conversation where you're willing to go against the other person. But then once you guys agree, you all get in line and you're all enthusiastic about that thing that you agreed to. And those are really the most um, well-functioning boards where you can have that hard conversation, but the enthusiastic agreement thereafter. You got through it and that's in the best interest of the company. And this is a sort of key point yesterday that came up. So I want to bring it up now. In companies, um, every decision can be recast because companies have one objective. Um, they are legally mandated to maximize shareholder value or firm value. And that's the responsibility of the directors. 
And so every investment decision, every payout decision, every decision is through that lens. So what makes DAOs a little bit tricky is you tend to have maybe more mission or have something. It's maybe, maybe there's a profit moment, but it's a profit plus something else. And those are typically values questions and values can you know, be very much misaligned. Uh, and my, by values here, I mean more sort of moral questions. Okay. So let's think about time, just how much time is it actually taking? So and for boards, they on average meet eight times per year and each meeting is sort of a seven hour meeting, a full day meeting, so 56 hours. On average, directors say they spend about 20 hours per month on work outside of these board meetings. Um, and you know, time does equal effective. I put consulting in quotes because this is a McKinsey study. Um, but what they do find is effective boards spend 30 to 50% more time per year on board work. Um, and all of this stuff comes from the National Association of Corporate Directors who do an annual survey. So what are the main committees? So all firms are mandated to have these three committees. Uh, compensation, so six meetings a year, three hours. It's basically setting exec comp, setting and reviewing performance related goals, um, determining the compensation structure. Um, and because of the way that laws are in the US, um, salary is capped at basically a million. Uh, and then anything above that has to be options or stock. There's monitoring and performance, and then advising on comp for non-executive employees. And then the other committee, it can typically be either called governance or nominating, but that's where you're basically really thinking about your CEO succession planning, uh, identifying new board nominees, and really like heavily recruiting talent, um, evaluating and recommending changes to governance, and then sort of managing evaluation processes. And I think this is really important to distinguish between monitoring and, you know, thinking about the process more formally, because sometimes, you know, once you get the person, you don't want a person to have too much uh, power. And this is sort of the way that they create checks and balances, even within a corporate structure. And then audit, uh, you know, eight meetings three times a year. And the idea is to prevent management manipulation of the audit by overseeing accounting choices. And so this one is the most time consuming. They have to I mean, they're basically dealing with the US government and making sure that the disclosure and reporting process is right. I put sometimes risk management here because it has become increasingly, especially as the number of risks, um, you know, you have a big cyber problem, you have a big financial risk problem, you have like lots of risk categories that you have to deal with. Um, many companies have actually started to create a, their own risk management committee. <clears throat> And this is a one point I do really want to make. Um, so there was a widespread belief, and I find that sometimes people haven't totally gone away from this idea because it's probably a little bit natural to think about, is groupthink and bad apples. So there used to be this really big belief that, you know, especially in law enforcement too, that it was just a few bad actors. And if we could get rid of those few bad apples, it would be fine. Everything else in the system functions well. And it really took the financial crisis and Enron and WorldCom and sort of all the bad things that happened uh, in the early 2000s to basically get a bunch of people to put research and time and effort into thinking about this and really digging through the data and saying, actually, no, it is not a rogue trader that caused the financial crisis. It is not one person who is, you know, Jeff Shelley is not the single person to blame for Enron and all of that stuff. And I really want to point that out because these decisions that they did were very, very, you know, I think sometimes my students, I, I think, I'm assuming you guys are much younger than me. My students didn't even know about Enron last year when I was teaching it to them. It was a company as big as Google is essentially now. They were one of the top five companies in the country. They lost $74 billion in less than a year. That was most people's pension funds because, remind you, these are utility workers. These are your grandparents. And... You know, most people at the time had 300,000 in retirement, if not more, of these older people who basically, after lawsuits, maybe eight years later, got 3,100 per person um, in the ultimate settlement. So, you know, I think just reminding yourself that it's about culture and reminding yourself how to uh, focus on a culture and creating a culture that actually tells people, this is my red line in the sand. This is where you guys cannot cross. 
you cannot discriminate against the whole class of people. You cannot make this decision. And this is sort of even going back to Uber, you know, and TK or Travis Kalanick going and saying, look, you know, if we're going to squirt against the law enforcement. This also means that you might skirt against sexual harassment practices or some of those things. And so thinking about that holistically. So board independence. This has generally been regulators oversight and I'll, I'll give you a mix of thoughts on it. Um, so to effectively provide advisory and oversight capacity, board members are expected to be independent. The key way we think about independence is sort of conflicts of interest, you know, minimize conflicts of interest as much as possible. Okay, it is also nice to have independence in the sense that people will take opposition points to management. Um, this really came up because a lot of, you know, some of the earlier scandals in the 80s and 90s, when people were looking at them, you know, it was basically everything got rubber stamped by, uh, you know, a friendly board or a co-opted board, as people like to say, is basically execs put all their friends on the board. It's not really useful for getting, you know, outside your bubble. Okay, so now the New York Stock Exchange requires uh, independent directors to be the majority, same thing on all of the key committees, audit, compensation, and governance. So what's the executive session? I actually really like this idea. They mandated it after Sarbanes-Oxley, and it says once a year, we need to get all directors together that are not insiders. So we don't want the executives here, and we want to actually just have a candid conversation about what's going on. And it's been I think very useful. You've actually seen changes in turnover and sort of patterns of this where, you know, they can discuss candidly the performance. And I think this idea of allowing that uh, is really helpful to understand if you need any change because there's still power from the insiders or the people who owned it or the people who founded it. There always will be. So board cognitive diversity, um, I really love this. So Sheila Blair was the head of the FDIC. So the FDIC, uh, is Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, when banks in the US, when they're gonna go under because we don't want bank runs, basically they have 48 hours. They quietly alert the FDIC and the FDIC tries to find a buyer. So she is in on all of these board meetings during the crisis when so many banks went under. Um, and she said, too much is made of independence. It's really more about people and whether they are competent so think about expertise and setting the right tone and culture. And so this goes back to sort of what I was saying before. Are you building that team? Are you building that culture within? Um, and how do you build culture? Maybe is one question. It's really like, are you sending out balloons? Are you sending out swag on whatever day is your annual day to get together? And even if you're not getting together there at their computer, you can send them that stuff there. You can do fun things uh, remotely. Okay. But so in this sense, directors are nominated by the company. They're awfully friendly to the CEO, but you want to find a right balance and sort of what people have looked at and they call cognitive diversity is right. Having a right mix of gender, ethnicity, age, education, industry expertise, also board experience at other places and other skills, you know, leadership, military experience, some of those things tend to come up, finance experience, engineering, sort of all the mix. Um, so removing directors and legal obligations. Generally in the US, it's really hard to remove directors, okay? Once elected by shareholders, directors usually serve their full term. Uh, and it's a mix of companies. I'd say it's still almost half and half that it's an annual election and then other people do what they call a staggered board. So maybe you have nine board members, it's three rotating each time are up for election. And the idea about that was that there was really a time where there was a lot of merger activity and they thought by having, you know, if somebody wants to take over your company, they're gonna get their full slate of directors elected. Okay, well, at least that gives you more time to fight them off that you can only get, they can only replace three per year. So that if they really, really wanna buy you, that's two years that they're waiting to do this. Um, so that's sort of the idea of why you might wanna stagger it. Um, so shareholders may vote to remove a director at an annual meeting, but in practice, shareholders usually can't get enough support. It's really hard to get enough people to like sign on a thing. Shareholders are dispersed and don't pay attention. Okay. So basically if once a director's there, it's hard to remove them. What's the business judgment rule? So directors all have fiduciary duties because they're elected by shareholders. Their duties are to the shareholder, but they can be held liable. Okay, it's sort of the same thing about, you know, who, if you're writing the code, can you be held liable? Can you be held liable for secondary liability? Sort of the same idea. So directors have a fiduciary duty of care to make duties consistent, basically, with the best interest of stockholders. 
okay? But acting in good faith, sort of which means fulfill in the duty of care, means the bus business judgment rule can protect directors from liability. And so that raises the standard of duty of care for not just um, maybe their decision was bad, but it's also you have to prove that their decision lost value for the company. And that's usually uh, trickier, okay? Um, it often comes up in m and debates. And so this is like, you know, for example, say you can show somebody who's con conflicted voted for uh, M&A deal. This is why then ultimately I'll say you want to cleanse your transaction. So there's no protection when directors act to intentionally harm a corporation or breach their fiduciary duty of loyalty. They also have a, a responsibility for candor. I will put point this out. Corporations incorporate by state. State defaults vary. Okay. And just like DAOs, you know, if you're default, if you don't actually do your paperwork as to a partnership, okay, Delaware partnerships are very different than ones in Nevada. So Nevada is generally what we think of as sort of the, you know, Sin City, same thing. It's actually not surprising that Vegas is there, but they have the worst corporate governance. They don't actually even require loyalty of directors. They allow a lot of freedom. Um, Delaware has the longest, most established precedent, and that's why 75% of corporations are incorporated in Delaware. Um, so board conflicts and cleansing a transaction. <laughs> what if your directors are conflicted? <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the Sheila Blair comment. Uh, it was a very good comment, thanks. <laughs> uh, so what if your directors are conflicted? This is where you wanna cleanse a transaction and the best way to do it is to basically remove your um, conflicted directors and basically use a subcommittee of non-conflicted directors and then they can basically vote on it. The key here though, legally, is that you have to make this subcommittee before um, anyone talks about price or um, basically starts to negotiate the transaction. Um, because if the director was involved before that, you can say that they influenced the price and stuff like that. Um, an alternative way, uh, especially what if everybody's magically, you know, conflicted, which ha does happen on some companies. Mind you, if you have proper diversity, um, it shouldn't happen. But uh, in that sense, you'd have a bunch of disinterested stockholders vote on it. Um, so providing guidance at what horizon. So I said that we had all oh, of this monitoring role and I sort of went on the monitoring, but we also have this role of what should we do? And so corporations live on into perpetuity. All right. Yet many directors have this fiduciary duty to stockholders. That's their primary duty. Um, and stockholders are known to be myopic. Um, investment horizons now are below one year, despite the tax incentives for it to be over a year holding period. Um, and so, now, the ESG movement has been trying to facilitate conversations about long-term best practices, but at the end of the day, it's still the truth that, um, you know, why we're having these different types of corporations or people are going towards a foundation format is the fact that you could build up an amazing company with all sustainable supply chains and all of your life's work put into it and say some, and I'm using it in China as an example, it could just as easily be Vietnam or somebody else who wants to come in and totally undo your supply chains and make them much cheaper. Um, and they can offer a higher price because that's their value add, but now it's not gonna be a sustainable company anymore. And the directors would have to sell. They're legally bound to sell to this higher price. Okay, and this is actually a lot of the problems uh, that has led people to think about other forms of corporations. So I think some of the questions I would put to you, and there's more that I can come up with, are sort of what would creating sub DAOs, much like board committees, help improve efficiency? Consider it ad hoc work as a committees work as a solution to conflicts of interest. You know, multiple signatures are often used as security measures. But what about thinking about multiple signatures helping to cleanse decisions when conflicted? Um, I think yesterday we had a lot of fun talk conversations about pay and how do you actually incentivize people with pay. Um, and what do you think about in-kind contributions versus uh, contributions that are mostly capital? You know, and I know some DAOs in this sense are experimenting with weighting votes in non-standard ways. So could weighting by holding period say you want to reward those people who have been there longer or want to reward those who and try and prevent between the inherent conflicts of interest and sort of 
But I think the dual edge sort of any of those things, if you're trying to incentivize there, is that you don't incentivize new participants. So how do you balance a way to incentivize new participants to continue to scale and grow? Um, those are just some questions we, I'm sure during the chat we'll have more. So unless I, do, unless I have other questions, I'm going to move on to sort of talking about these protections against activists. So I want to remind everybody about where equity crisis come from. They're a function of payout. If you remember from basics, the value of any asset is its expected cash flow um, discounted at the rate of return that could be achieved outside. Okay. Well, if we think of a company as basically a bunch of tangible and intangible assets, same thing, all these cash flows, we can combine all the cash flows. Okay. Well, the firm, you have to pay off to your debt holders first. They have priority. Then you pay your equity holders. Okay. So equity holders always get the residual that's left after all debts are paid off. Great. Well, what is that residual? That residual is essentially what would be the dividend if you did a final period dividend. Okay. And so what we think of this as is, or a buyout, you can just do a buyback and buy back their shares, but they're the same thing, they're equivalent. Um, and so the value per stock is really, because corporations live on to infinity, the expectation of dividend payments into infinity discounted here, what we think of is the cost of equity, what it would cost you to basically go and buy that equity in the market right now, or uh, raise that amount of equity in the market. So estimating any function to infinity can be problematic or predicting div dividends, it's challenging. So typically we break it up into two things. Uh, you know, part one is the growth period, part two is stable growth. So then you can rechange that formula now into this sort of terminal value and then this sort of growth period. Assume, let's just focus more on if we assume that the main majority of the value is coming from the terminal value, which is true, same thing in, in an M&A deal, then we focus on that. If you remember the perpetuity formula, you actually can rearrange it and get it to be the expectation of dividends the next period, your cost of equity minus G, where what is G? G is usually what we think of as the growth rate of the economy. Basically, most people put 3%. It's no, you can never have a company that's bigger than the economy. Um, so at the limit, and even if you're scaling and growing, you're always going to reach you know, the size of the globe. So that has to be 3%. And that's sort of how we think about it. So clearly prices are a function of what this expectation people have for payout. So what determines the optimal level of payout? It's typically firm specific. So think about, you know, what are your earnings growth, investment, all of those things. It's economic too. You know, how cyclical is your industry? How much access to capital do you have? How much inflation consumption changes matter for you? It's about alleviating agency costs. And this one I, I love to emphasize, it's just so true. Um, if you look at the data, firms that pay out dividends, their managers just make much more efficient investment decisions. Basically, when you have money to burn in your pockets, as we like to say, or you're a cash cow firm, you make bad decisions. There's a ton of evidence about it. Okay. And then investors, you know, preferences for payout. So there is the US has prudent person rules. Um, which says there's a long ago, there was a court case to try and define what speculative meant. We define speculative as basically any stock that doesn't pay dividends. And so ever since then, anybody who manages public money, so manages pension funds or anything like that, has to invest. Um, so this is all of your big institutional investors that own 70% of the stocks have to invest in dividend paying stocks. Okay, so people like dividends. Okay, so why do I bring this up? Well, I'm putting a comp governance token. Okay, so if you look at the documentation for comp, and this is what they say on their website, compound is managed by the centralized community of comp token holders and their delegates who propose and vote on upgrades to the protocol. So the only thing you're doing is voting on upgrades to the protocol. The documentation, it's clear that it states that there's no expectation of profit from comp. So it's giving this strong case for passing the Howey test. That's why they said that. But is it an expectation of profit in the short or long term? And I, this is where you, there must be a contingent of token holders who believe that they could propose, approve, and implement a mechanism to capture some part of the cash flow from the lending protocol in the future for this to have value. Okay. Equity prices are also a function of control. 
Okay. So I'm, it's not going to say that I don't think voting matters. Voting just doesn't, you know, we think of it as time varying much more, not mattering as much as payout. Okay. So agency costs are problematic, but voters get to vote. And that's usually thought to be as an important part of it. So how do you actually figure out what the value of the vote is? Luckily, there's lots of ways people have tried to get at it. I think the one that's probably the best is to basically compare options prices. It's because options, remember, you can basically create a synthetic share by selling options. They're the only things you're not entitled to through the options market. So basically you get no dividends and you don't get the uh, voting rights. Okay, so if you can adjust for dividends, then that gives you a really pretty good sense and it shows you a time varying sense of what the voting right is. Okay, when people have done this, the value of voting rights generally vary between like one and 10%. Um, I will admit other people have done studies based on say dual class share systems. Dual class usually brings you more than just voting rights um, and controlling blockholder selling sales. But these are the value of the vote as a percentage of the overall value of the firm. And if you see, 10% is about where it comes up regularly. We had one in Italy where it came up as 80%. Um, other than that, you know, it's sort of a wide range. But I think what I want to other point out is, as Luigi Zangala said, why might these be divergent? Well, the price of a vote is determined by the expected additional payment vote holders will receive for their votes in the cases of control contests. So studies of the vote basically suggests it could increase like 10x around these important events. What are these important events? What they call special shareholder meetings. So if you have to convene to basically try to throw out a director or to vote on an M&A deal or something. Annual meetings where you meet to vote on the agenda where the agenda has a high ranking item. Meetings that end up having close call votes. Announcements of hedge fund activism. Announcements of M&A deals. Okay. Activists love payouts. This is David Einhorn from Greenlight Capital. And this was a quote, when a third of the value of a company is cash, it requires the amount of energy usually required for managing the business. If you have cash, which lots of um, treasuries were very rich um, not too long ago, uh, activist investors love to come in and they are not afraid of going after anybody. He went after Apple, uh, he actually got and this is a case where activists actually lose. They most often actually win. He wanted to Apple to issue high pref shares of $2 uh, each year to attempt to lure new investors. Didn't work. Um, so the love of payout though is no different in DAOs. So a hacker slowly bought enough stake, 33% to control a, a true synorage dollars DAO voting process. And then the hacker basically proposed a new implementation in the code and using his own stake, he basically was able to pass the changes. And then when implementing it, he inserted a malicious code to mint himself coins that wiped out the value of treasury. Okay, he just wanted to pay out. It's totally what people want. So protocols are implementing protections against risks like this. You know, this is where multi-sig comes in. It's also where maybe the inability to access functions like minting. Okay, thoughts on that, some of that stuff, but also recognition that you know payout may actually reduce risk you know treasury management especially in the blockchain world is super challenging people cannot know your positions so it's really hard to manage liquidity when other people know what you're trading um, there is a reason why all institutional investors trade on dark pools it's because then they can send it in there and algorithm can match it up and you don't actually know if blackrock's the one that you're trading shares with or if it is a smaller hedge fund um, so maintaining smaller treasury functions to the extent possible via some type of payout may actually mitigate rather than amplify risk. So there's legal limits to payout and sort of a key issue when approving a dividend or thinking about it that way is that you have uh, who's at risk of not being paid out. And so this is where creditors really come up. They'll often negotiate to include covenants. So dividend restriction covenants that limit payout to some portion of basically earnings or surplus except for, you know, as firms quickly learned, you can manipulate the definition of earnings or surplus. Um, maintenance covenants are basically the solution to that, where you basically put a limit on the uh, leverage ratio. And you say you, at some leverage ratio, you have to get rid of the payout. Beyond covenants, the two sort of ones that 
tend to matter are legal capital requirements and fraudulent transfer laws. Legal capital requirements, though, um, if you've ever opened um, a person's stock certificate or their statement, like say, you know, you open Meta and on the first page you'll see then it says the value of like a common share is 0. 0.00006 cents. This is actually the paid in capital. So a lot of people have decided this is the required amount you must keep at the firm and not spend on stuff. Um, for whatever reason, we've created it into a loophole where people say it's only so little very much. So instead of fraudulent transfer is really the only one that protects you, but it actually protects you well. Um, so Basically, what is fraudulent transfer? This is the idea that, you know, we know we're going to go under probably in the next few days. Let's issue a big dividend of any money we have left to the people who are equity holders rather than pay back other people. OK, um, that's going to that's going to crush you. So directors who I told you were protected under the business judgment rule, it's like even worse. So if they do that, if they distribute assets in excess of what should be made pursuant in liquidation, they actually have personal liability. That's more than just like general liability. That means that you can go after them also in a civil case so that they'd be crushed. Okay. And so the bottom line is this prospect of personal liability from excess distribution means that most board members um, are going to be very fearful of these fraudulent transfer laws. So shareholder sponsored portfolios. This is my last thing. So I, I've done actually some research myself on <coughs> DAOs. Uh, we're in the process. We have about 1,800 proposals that we've collected across 50 plus DAOs um, to try and understand it. And you guys will think it's crazy how it's done, um, how much slower and more uniform the process is on the corporate side. So proposals all get aggregated together. You vote on proposals once a year at the annual meeting. This is prob probably legacy of the fact that it was hard to actually convene together. And so they do it once a year. And you know, if anybody's ever been to Warren Buffett's like, uh, you know, big thing in Omaha, you know, people love to go. It's really actually a big party. It's a big hurrah for the um, fun of it. So let's uh, think about what's going on. So what do you do? Shareholder proposals must be received six months prior to the annual meeting date to be included on this proxy slate. There's a whole bunch back and forth there for after. So I would call the next four months this back and forth period. Typically, if management see a proposal, they're going to attempt to have a dialogue with that shareholder. Okay, sometimes that will result in management making minor concessions and shareholders pulling their proposal. Management can also try to get a proposal dropped for technical reasons, and they actually often do. Um, just because shareholders aren't that smart sometimes at how they file them. That's why you usually need a big institution or a hedge fund to file it, because they have a better legal team. Um, and the SEC cannot rule on whether a proposal, so it's actually courts can adjudicate on that if they're obligated to include it. Then you get to the 60 days prior. 60 days prior, they have to file the final proxy statement. And in here, and this is something that might be useful for DAOs, they have the exact wording. You know, they're all the same. It all looks the same. They have the exact wording of the shareholder proposal, but then management writes in the paragraph underneath it, what do they want? What they think about it. Typically management doesn't like it, you know, but they'll tell you why and they'll justify it. And then since 1988, the Department of Labor has made it a fiduciary duty for pension funds to vote. So voter turnout is very high since 70% of stocks are owned by institutions. Okay, so this is why they actually don't have this problem in the corporate setting that I think you have of lack of voter participation in the DAO setting. Other things. So, well, as I'll show, people don't, you know, which shareholders, when, how often, what type. So we started to change the rules a little bit. This is a fairly recent adjustment, although there had always been some sort of version of this, is tiered ownership requirements. So they trade off between holding period and the value of your securities, for example, uh, you cannot bring a proposal, um, so it's basically three-year holding period and need only 2,000 investment, or if you've only held for a year, you need 25,000 investment. You have a one proposal limit per year, okay? And why do we bring this up? I, I think Petco is a great example of it. If you look, almost nearly every year in the 2000s, these animal activists would buy a small ownership stake, like $2,000 in Petco, and they would put in a proposal um, that they ended up having to put on about 
you know, changing its treatment of animals. They never had any business logic or anything about it. They didn't even like really like go there and they never received 10% of even 10% of support for it. But yeah, I, each year it had to come up each year. They would go to the meetings and put these horrible like signs up and all of this stuff. It's a minority shareholder is not what the majority of people wanted. Okay. So the SEC has changed rules on when you can submit. Okay. Less than 5% of the votes. If previously voted on one time, you can't resubmit. Less than 15% of the votes if previously voted on two times. Less than 25% of the votes if voted on three times. And I have li I have seen in some of the Dow proposals we're analyzing, literally identical, almost identical proposals being brought up shortly thereafter. Okay. And then interestingly, uh, they the SEC when they first put it out before they like adopted this rule, they had actually had the word momentum that you couldn't rebring it up if it had lost, uh, had lower vote share the second time. Um, but they have now changed their, they took that out, but maybe something we're thinking about. Okay, so in conclusion, um, you know, I think there's a lot of insights from corporations that we can uh, build on. Uh, so I think of corporations, you know, they designate discrete responsibilities. And that's something that I think DAOs are going to, as they grow, you know, discord and discourse is sort of out of control. You can see it's hard to parse through all of that. Uh, you know, having committee work makes sense, but how do you align uh, across committees? Are committees just their own little autonomous organizations? If they are, and if they disagree, what do you want to do? Do you spin off? Do you fork? Like, you know, thinking about some of that stuff. And then also sort of this value of DAO contributors, this energy versus time. And what do DAOs like contributors really want? Do they want payout? Um, I will answer questions in like two minutes, one second. So I think other insights from finance uh, is sort of AI reduced the cost of exploration and prediction. So this is how I think, okay, maybe I'll just answer your question one second. Okay, so do you get increased um, resubmission threshold if your subsequent proposal goes from 5% to 20% from each vote? Um, So if you had it the first time and it was only 5%, you couldn't bring it again. You, it's, it's a waiting period. You could have some other shareholder and bring it like in three years is basically you could do that. Um, if the second time you got 20%, now you're above that threshold uh, of whatever the number was. So you could basically vote on it again the third time. If, you ha if it's the third time that it hasn't went up, it's went up and that you don't have more than 25%, you couldn't bring it again. You could wait through. There's a waiting period of about three years, I think. I can't, I haven't looked at the final rules. It used to be three years when I wrote a paper on this in 2014. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so let's think about what I think of the main insights from finance is just to remember what are DAOs doing in the big picture. So I think of AI as basically it reduced the cost of exploration and prediction. So that's why everybody wants to use AI and invest in it. Blockchain rec reduced the cost of state verification. Great. What does this mean then for DAOs? It means it reduced the cost of coordinating complex services. Okay, so the efficiency gains from reducing the line item associated with managers or centralized intermediaries will encourage adoption. But I put here, if the underlying governance is stable, um, there's a reason why we have, you know, sort of the system that we have. I, I it is true that the banks are much more solid now than they ever were in the past. It's true that companies now, as they're incorporating um, ESG practices and doing different things, they're evolving. They're way better than they used to be. Okay. And so this is sort of my other key point is about evolution. I think the flexibility of DAOs is amazing. Um, you know, it's you can tailor stuff and you can customize in a way that it was never previously possible because we had, you know, we had state laws so you could sort of customize around the edge, but it's like, you know, it's not that much. You have much more flexibility. So, you know, while early corporations did things that are illegal by today's standards, and they certainly did, they also have evolved. And I think you need to think about how you ensure adaptability and so for me, this is a question I've thought about a lot. What is the ultimate goal of DAOs? If we can say for firms that the ultimate goal is to maximize value, what is it for DAOs? And I like the paper um, where they were suggested that the goal might be the sustainability of the protocol. Okay, and, and that relates to open source code. 
well, is open source code a public good? If it is, then you need somebody investing in it. I don't think it's a public good necessarily. I don't want the government controlling it and investing in it. And so, but how do you ensure somebody's going to maintain and help and do all of this? And that I think involves this like type of flexibility um, and bringing that about. And so I think it's a nice hybrid between what is really corporates. And even though I know your default is to a partnership, there is some other ones. So Marshall Islands is having a little bit different um, type of legal wrapper um, for DAOs, but these are sort of just things to think about. I'm open to questions, but thank you guys so much for listening to me early in the morning. I appreciate it. Anybody have any questions? Um, I, I have like a, a bunch of questions. I don't know. <laughs> I kind of like, I'm hesitant to just go immediately. No, just, just jump in. It's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, feel free to stop me other, other listeners. If, if y'all have more pertinent things to ask. Um, I guess the first, first question I have, um, sort of relates to like aspirations. Like what, what do you think? Like maybe this is like a, a place to put in personal personal take, um, but also maybe more objective answer is appropriate too. Like what do you just think of the idea of this like clearly precedented, very like rules um, and like pluralistic based system of corporate shareholder governance versus like the very ad hoc kind of harebrained version version of like it's yeah, it's it's crypto or like decentralized blockchain analogs. Like is is the idea of positing this as like this clearly precedented, maybe not like perfect, but at least like functional system um, to have it serve as, as an aspiration? Like, oh, like you crypto people that are just kind of like figuring this out almost like accidentally, like maybe you should pay attention closer to how like Warren Buffett and his comrades in Omaha like handle their shareholder meetings. Or is it just like, this exists, y'all are doing your own thing. And like, maybe there's some lines of communication between the two, but it's more important about along the lines of it, it uh, of its divergence. Yeah. So I think my first question is going to be about stakes. Um, and, you know, so are you growing to be, uh, a, you know, are you make your doubt? Are you growing and being and going to basically be a huge player? I think when you're going to be a huge player, you need the protection and the stability that comes from uniformity. Um, and I think there's there's a lot of literature on like, you know, what what is the evolution of a founder? Founders usually hands on the deck. Everybody does everything at the beginning. It's a jack of all trades. And then there's a point where you have to become more authoritarian. Um, and I talked to my class about what's the difference between uh, authority and leadership. And leadership is followers. And so it's like this fine line to walk because they have to become authoritarian, but also be a leader. Okay, and I think that's the same idea. So if you have stakes that are high, especially on money and some of those things, I think you're going to have to have a more formalized system. On the other hand, um, and I, I love this example. I found it. I found this paper. It was actually, I think he's a student. It was super cute. I liked it. Um, he was in Brooklyn. He wrote about uh, DAOs as, uh, or what, Alcoholics Anonymous as the first DAO. I really love that example because they have these sort of rules, but their rules are, it's only 12. And they basically have organizations that have this local, localized ability, and they they can make some adjustments locally, but they really sort of stick to these twelve rules. And so, you know, I think that. But there, what's the stake? I mean, you might think that being an alcoholic is a high stake, but it's not. Uh, this goes back to like sort of autonomous vehicles and all of this stuff. There's a reason life or death is a big stake. Typically, people take money as a big stake. Um, this is why we, you know, we're okay with bad advertisements and experimenting there because it's bad advertisement for us. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of have to take that into consideration on what people um, would think about it. So I guess my my view is, yes, I think some of them are going to have to adopt it. What I think is so cool about you guys is that you get to experiment. Um, and then I think you might not have some of these problems we have with sort of uh, compensation and executive compensation being out of control. And I think you actually might be able to solve my dream is you're going to get rid of the managerial class. Uh, I mean, I probably can't totally get rid of the managerial class, but massively reduce it and then put people in more functional positions. 
I mean, I think everybody's probably experienced the joy of working for a bad boss. It's really a horrible experience and it, it's not good for anybody. And I think like eliminating that experience and allowing people to have more positive experiences encourages more contribution, more building, more, uh, you know, growth. Um, wait, just last little follow-up question. Is there a place where you've like the last 15 seconds of what you're just talking about where you've written about that? I, I'm curious to unpack it more, but I don't want to take it anymore. Uh, so we are, <laughs> I got a grant to write this paper. I've been sort okay. of looking at the jobs and uh, descriptions and how it's changing. Um, okay. But yeah, the, I mean, it's a thought I have. I've written more on how AI is going to displace high-skilled workers, um, which then it made me start to think, you know, what I what my takeaway from AI, my, I have a paper on AI, is that it actually it can't replace social skills. And so what you end up seeing for high skilled workers, and so I was looking in the finance industry in particular, they actually spend more time on meetings with management um, mm -hmm. and they spend less time on financial modeling. And mm -hmm. so it, the fact that they're over relying on your social skills, and, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think social skills are really important, but it made me start to think about, well, the key social skill person is usually managers and there's such a big literature on bad management. Yeah. Um, Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Cool. Uh, I look forward to chatting with you all at, at the sessions. Um, hopefully, I'd love to hear about what you guys are doing too. Okay.